Heavenly Father, we we praise you and, and, and thank you for all that you are and all that you've done for us to make us uh, yours, to bring us into your kingdom uh, through the, the, the sacrifice of Christ. And we, we pray that you help us to, to strive each day to live up to the call that you've given us to be the men that we ought to be, uh, to, to be a support to our, our brothers and our families uh, and your church. To, to seek out every opportunity to serve you and serving others and, and, and to, uh, to, to be a light in this world, to, to bring others to know you. And it's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Um, all of us who are live right now, or I should say none of us have kids at home. Of course, that, that was new for me. Uh, well, that's new for David uh, uh, in here, and that was new for me uh, two school years ago. And um, so there's there's one section where it really talks about kind of family oriented, but then there's there's a section we'll do later where it's uh, for guys over 50. And, and David, I know you're not over 50 yet, but the the author when he wrote the book had just turned 50 or was just into his 50s, and um, and so that kind of motivated him, you know, to. Uh, to kind of reevaluate and do so, so I'll have a little bit of both. So if, if someone, if you're watching later, um, hopefully one of those two categories will fit for you. And, and for tonight, um, uh, just kind of put up with that first part about <laughs> kids, and then, uh, but then you can look forward to the the over fifty part. And they're just little brief, you know, illustrations and and lists of things for people to do. So it uh, it'll it'll be fine, of course. But tonight we are doing the King Pillar. And so I do want to start with our uh, verse and a couple of slides that we'll have every week, but uh, Psalm 103, 15 and 16, as for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field for the wind passes over it and it is gone and its place knows it no more. Uh, our job is to really flourish while we're here and do the best we can and be the men as David just prayed uh, that we ought to be. Um, and these are the four pillars, once again, a man of vision and character, the servant king, the tender warrior, a man of strength and power, a man of faith and wisdom, the wise mentor, and then the faithful friend, a man of heart and love. And it takes four pillars to make a man, a man who will bear the weight, stand against the elements, and hold one small civilization intact in a world that would like nothing better than to tear it down. So whatever our environment, uh, whether we do have kids at home still, whether we're in kind of that transition stage with, with kids in college, uh, like uh, David and I are, as far as the live ones here, no matter who we have influence over, we have this, this little environment uh, that we have a little bit of control over, and, and we should do the best we can to glorify God, exalt Christ, and uh, keep in step with the Spirit as we do that. And then his little motivational statement at the bottom, what kind of man am I? What kind of man are you? How can we become what we so deeply need to be? Let's walk the path together and see what we might find. So tonight we'll do the king pillar, and then uh, we will spend two weeks on the warrior pillar, two weeks on the mentor pillar, and two weeks on the friend pillar, um, ending slightly before the quarter ends on uh, February uh, 17th there. So you can see the four chapters in the book that are under the King Pillar. Camelot Revisited is, is a chapter that is going back to King Arthur to some extent, and then the Kennedys, and just kind of that, that picture, almost the fantasy picture of, of people wanting to have an environment that's great, an environment that is, um, I mean, somewhat uh, magical, so to speak, uh, but going back to a place like that and, and, and our ability to kind of create that, but it's, it, there's no creating that in that chapter, just kind of that vision kind of idea. Um, a Realm at Risk is the chapter that really kind of restates some things that we've talked about, uh, not only in this class, but in some other classes, just, just noting the fact that we are uh, in a fallen world, that it's a messy, messy place. Obviously, there's sin. Obviously, there's tribulation and trials and temptation. There are all sorts of things going on in this world. And so no matter what our realm is, whether it's um, a, a family of five with all the kids still at home, 
or just a man and wife in retirement or a, a single person who has his influence at his work. And of course, all of us have influence in our local congregation, in our church. And so whatever the realm is, the realm is at risk. Uh, the world, and we can be more specific even, Satan, he wants to destroy us. Satan wants to bring us down, uh, which again, kind of boggles the mind. If I'm going to go down, I don't want other people going down with me. I've never understood that. Uh, the middle school philosophy where if a girl can't have a boy as her boyfriend, she doesn't want any girl to have him. And so attacks and does awful things to keep anyone from having that guy as, as, a, as a boyfriend. Um, but some people are like that. And Satan is the ultimate of that. He knows he's defeated. He has been struck down. And he wants to pull as many with him as possible. It's just, it really is unbelievable. It's uh, terrible. Um, but the realm is at risk uh, because of all those different factors. And for us who are, for those of us who are Christians, Satan, he, he does want to get us. Um, you know, people in the world, you know, he, he's the deceiver. He's the tempter. I mean, people, all sorts of people do all sorts of terrible things. But he, he would love to take those who are in Christ and move them to a position of out of Christ. And so uh, we do have a realm at risk. As servant king, uh, we then should provide direction and we should shepherd. And those, there's a lot of similarities between providing direction and being the shepherd. Uh, the shepherd, though, he emphasizes the protection. So the, the provision emphasized in that third chapter under this category and the uh, the provision and then the protection as shepherd. Um, and he, he points out more than once that, you know, the shepherd never gets a break. The shepherd has to be watching those sheep. And of course, David is used as an illustration as one who fought off a lion, fought off a bear uh, to protect uh, his flock. And of course, God will do, uh, he wants to protect us as well. And we should allow him, of course, uh, to do that. So uh, again, just our little uh, diagram here. I'm just going to look at the king real quick. If we, um, we don't want to abdicate our responsibilities. We don't want to be a king abstentia. We don't want to disappear. We want to, to be the king we need to be. We don't want to overdo it and become a tyrant. Uh, we really need to be a servant king. Uh, one who has vision. You can see that at the top of the pillar. And one who provides um, in uh, at the bottom of the pillar. So um, just wanted to note that again, here's our column uh, in the, the other chart. Um, uh, the king uh, provides uh, the energy of just and creative ordering. The, the king cares deeply. Um, obviously, if we care, we're not going to be a tyrant. Uh, we're going to be people leading uh, in the right direction, uh, providing that, that guidance. Um, uh, this can help overcome disorder, chaos, family dysfunction, uh, and oppression. I do a um, thing with couples. Um, oftentimes, it's premarital counseling. Occasionally, um, it's it's marital counseling, and uh, it's called Prepare and Rich. Uh, the the program Prepare is if they're not married yet, and Rich is if the people are already married. And um, uh, one thing that it it um, evaluates. As the, as the couple answers all their questions and turns those in. Uh, used to be a Scantron sheet back when I started doing it. Now it's all online, of course. But uh, one thing it, it evaluates is the family of origin and the, the level at which people are connected. And there can be overly connected or, of course, under connected. And then the idea of freedom and movement uh, within the relationships. And sometimes... Uh, that the king being out of balance to the tyrant stage would be um, uh, where there's where there's no freedom. It's totally constricted, totally. And and so what you look for is that the man and, and the woman are coming from the same kind of, if they come from the same environment, probably everything's going to be fine. If they come from totally different situations, then a lot of times they're going to really struggle with the kids because one is going to Oh, be very nonchalant about things. One's going to be very strict about things, and and that can cause trouble. We, no matter what our environment is, whether it's family, church, uh, workplace, neighborhood, um, we want to be we want to be the king, but we want to be a servant. We want to care deeply. We don't want to over 
uh, emphasize authority and we don't want to underemphasize it either. We just want to have that stable uh, place uh, to be. And uh, here's the here's the verse that was at the top of the chart. Uh, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And so the, the king, the servant king uh, provides. Um, just um, it's kind of an introduction. This is kind of that first chapter, Camelot. These are some of the verses that were uh, used there at the, at the beginning. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. So this would be kind of the tyrant leaning uh, pillar. But Jesus says, among you, it will be different. <laughs> he doesn't say, I want it to be different. He, he says, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so as with all the pillars, our supreme example, the one that we look to, is uh, Jesus Christ. And he, he knows that the world has a different model when it thinks of a king. Uh, but under God's supervision, under Christ, uh, the, king, the king is different. The, the king is a servant. And that's, that's quite amazing. We, in last night's class, we noted some um, paradoxes that are in scripture. For example, uh, you give to receive. Uh, you lose your life to find your life. You know, and, and on and on and on we could go uh, with that. And this is one of those uh, that is a paradox to the world. Uh, to be the king, you serve. And of course, Jesus did exactly that. Um, Matthew 6, 24 says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Um, he used New Living Translation for that first one. This is actually ESV here. I forgot to change the initials there. But this, what you see before you is English Standard uh, Version. Um, and the idea is that there always is an authority. There always is a master. And we will have a master. And we need to make sure it's God. Uh, or we will not be the king, the servant king that we need to be. If we allow anything else to be our master, if we allow anything else to be our God, uh, we will get uh, in in trouble. Um, so he says, uh, given all those that information, uh, this is from Weber. He says, so take charge, organize and lead. A very basic part of being male is taking initiative. Some of us obviously are a lot better than that than others. Um, I would be considered in the, weak in that, I would say. Uh, Greg, I would consider one of the strongest ever in that, but not with any kind of attitude and not with any kind of issue. I mean, no one views him as someone who's going to go and get what he wants done. Never would someone think of that with Greg. Um, but he is amazing with his skills in moving from point A to point B. Uh, just absolutely incredible. Uh, this is an area where I need to be better. Um, so we take this initiative, we organize, we lead, we take charge. Considerately, yes. Thoughtfully, yes. Lovingly, yes. Putting the other person's interests above your own, always. But doing it, leading and organizing, taking responsibility and initiative. And I really like that because it throws in all the things that we know about Christ. He was always considerate. He was always thoughtful. He was always loving. And of course, perfectly he always put other people's interests above his own. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. I mean, just absolutely incredible. So any um, comments up to this point? Anything anyone wants to add or uh, give an illustration for? Just throwing it out there. If you're listening to this at double speed, it will be a very quick pause. <laughs> right, <dude. laughs> All right. Always jump in whenever you want. Absolutely. So um, and another little section in this first part, um, mature masculine leadership. And again, this is more focusing on family and, and marriage. Uh, serves and sacrifices for a woman's good. Mature masculine leadership points the woman to Christ. Makes the most of others' strengths. Takes the general responsibility to initiate. 
expresses itself romantically. Uh, it should be have an S on that. Takes the initiative in disciplining the children. Finds appropriate ways to express masculinity and knows that leadership requires repentance and humility. And obviously I like all eight of those, uh, but the last one, I think it's really important that a leader, um, well, no matter what the realm is, uh, that a leader realizes the importance of repenting continually. Uh, we constantly want to be turning ourselves more and more and more toward Christ and away from the world, away from sin, whatever those things are that, that get in the way of our being the men we need to be, the things that get in the way of us being uh, spiritually mature, and humility. And repentance and humility oftentimes go together anyway. It's, it's hard to repent if one is not humbling him or herself before the Lord. They kind of naturally uh, go together. All right, so in the realm at risk, all I'm going to do is read the, the little passages that were at the beginning of it. Uh, Proverbs 28, 15, and 16. Like a roaring lion or a charging bear is a wicked ruler over a poor people. A ruler who lacks understanding is a cruel oppressor. And then here's our positive statement. But he who hates unjust gain will prolong his days. And again, Weber, um, uh, he was a Green Beret. Um, he, you know, I, I think he probably, he, if, if his pillar was leading one way or the other, I get the impression from his illustrations of the things he says, he was a little bit too overbearing. So I think he's fighting that a lot as he writes these chapters, which is great. That's what, that's what he needs to do. Some of us may need, some of us may be lacking in the leadership initiative kind of feel, and we have to pull that pillar back to, uh, to standing tall. Um, but we don't want to be a roaring lion or a charging bear. We don't want to um, put unnecessary burdens on people. Of course, the Pharisees were just experts at this. Um, you know, Jesus fought them and fought them on what they would do because they would put all these burdens on people um, unnecessarily. They were just terrible to the people. Um, they were, they were, I don't know if I want to go so far as to say wicked rulers over the people, but they, they caused a lot of trouble. Um, and they definitely lacked understanding. Uh, they were oppressive and, and we don't want to be like that. Uh, second Samuel 23, three and four, the God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, when one rules justly over men ruling in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. I mean, wow. Yeah, that's what we want to be, right? Not just for our families, but for each other in this room and in our congregation, at our workplace. I mean, what a great compliment. What a great thing to be put, put on a tombstone. When he, when he walked in a room, he was like the morning light. He was like the sun shining on a cloudless morning. He was like rain that caused things to grow. I mean, nourishing, comforting, providing what people need. I mean, that is a fabulous uh, uh, statement. So when we rule justly over the people around us, here it says, when one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God. That's the other, that's the, we're going to rule justly if we are allowing the fear of God to be over us. And we're going to have the fear of God over us if we are ruling justly. And so this is how we want uh, to be. And I really uh, like that one. And then he, then he uh, moves to the New Testament for these introductory passages. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Uh, chapter 3, verse 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Again, these are things to keep in mind when protecting, when, when realizing that the realm is at risk, that people are possibly and almost definitely going to be in trouble. And then from chapter 5, uh, verses 3, 6, and 11, 
not domineering. Of course, this is a section talking about elders particularly, and he applies it to any leadership role. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. And then he ends with the one who has supreme dominion, getting back to the idea that we can't serve two masters. We can't have two masters. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Uh, the shepherd of our souls, God Almighty, he needs to take uh, dominion. So um, any any comments here? I'll just pause briefly. All right. All right. So let's talk about providing direction and let's talk about the shepherding. And that's where we'll spend uh, most of our time here, probably 10 minutes on each. Um, so the king does provide direction. And that's what we want in a, in a king. Jesus provided, he didn't provide physical direction. He, he did for his disciples and apostles sometimes. He would lead them around, you know, Israel at different times. Uh, let's go here. Let's go there. Um, let's go back to Jerusalem. And they're all freaking out. No, we don't. But he still led them to Jerusalem. Uh, Thomas saying, hey, let's just go die with him. Um, you know, we think of Thomas as doubting Thomas, but he he had his moments of strength as well. Um, but rather, Jesus, of course, provides spiritual direction. He provides um, emotional direction. He provides the direction that we need uh, to, to live our lives well, uh, moral direction. Um, and so we also then, as servant kings, need to provide people uh, with direction. And um, we, we all have responsibility for that, depending, and, and the, the extent of that responsibility depends on our, whatever that little realm is uh, that we have, the environment that we're in, we could say. Uh, Joshua 24, 14, and 15. Now, therefore, this is Joshua actually speaking here. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your father, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua was the leader. Uh, he was the one providing the direction. Um, he, he worded all this as a question. You know, we, we may have to do that sometimes. We may have to say, okay, Fishinger and Kenny, or okay, family, or okay, neighborhood. You know, what are you going to do, this or this? Well, let me tell you what I'm going to do. And, of course, Joshua wanted them to follow his example and follow his lead. Um, and this is kind of like, you know, the impossibility of serving two masters. Joshua's laying it out. You know what? You're either going to serve the Lord, fear the Lord, or you're going to do something else. And the something else is never appropriate. Uh, he mentions other gods even here. And, uh, you know, it's it's a no way kind of proposition. In Genesis 33, and we just talked about this uh, last Saturday night in the Genesis class, um, and it happens to be one of the introductory passages for this uh, providing direction and, and providing protection uh, as well, um, providing for uh, the family. Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming, and 400 men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two female servants. He, he, he wanted to protect them. He wanted to take care of them. That's his job, to protect, to provide. And, um, and he wanted to make sure that nothing was going to happen to the family. He didn't know how Esau was going to be. So he lifted up his eyes. He looked, and behold, Esau was coming, and 400 men with him. So he divides the children. He put the servants with their children in front, then Leah with her children, then Rachel and Joseph last of all. So he did have priorities, <laughs> uh, which we would probably not be that blatant um, in these days, that's for sure. But he himself went first. Jacob himself went on before them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. So 
one of the most touching little verses in scripture, verse four here. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. So Jacob, it turns out, didn't need to be worried, but he was still doing what a servant king would do. And if anyone was going to die, he was going to die first. He went and took the lead. And then the servants, his wives, and the children after that. So great example uh, we have of Jacob there. So here's some um, direction for after age 50. Uh, Weber, as he's writing this chapter, um, is, is just having a, I wouldn't call it a midlife crisis at all. I think it's anything that happens when you hit certain ages. You just kind of say, okay, I'm here. You know, what do I need to do? What do I need to change? What do I need to make sure I'm being careful about? Um, and he says, and this would be true for anyone of any age, but, but for him, it was 50. Thoughtfully proactive and less habitually reactive. And this with his time and money. He specifically spent some time talking about the money, how he and his wife, you know, just raising kids, you know, just all the chaos that goes on with life. Uh, they had pretty much been reactive to things. Okay, th this needs to be done. I mean, uh, I don't know about y'all, but Jennifer and I, I mean, we, we, we spent and probably still are spending years in that same kind of mode. Okay, the car needs repaired. So, you know, boom, th this needs done. So boom, uh, right now, uh, Josh and Katie need tuition money. <laughs> boom. So, um, so, but he was saying a shift needed to happen for them and they needed to become less reactive, uh, which was their habit and more thoughtfully proactive. And I think, of course, that's true with money throughout our lives, but, but with time, um, with stewardship of the brain, even uh, stewardship of our mental health and stewardship of emotions we we need always to be moving from less reaction to more uh being proactive in our lives concerning all sorts of things uh definitely with bible study and prayer and uh, the things that can help us grow spiritually we need to be very proactive in those things and make sure they're happening um in, inject into life at fairly regular interval intervals time for personal rejuvi rejuvenation, uh, times of refreshing, times of refreshment. Now, the Bible talks about those. God wants us to be refreshed. He wants us to uh, take the time to rest, to, uh, we might call it entertainment as opposed to refreshment, but, but have those times where there is a break. Jesus would go off to lonely places. Of course, he would spend a lot of that time in prayer um, from what we can gather. Uh, but we need to make sure those things are happening in life. And this, this goes right along with being thoughtfully proactive uh, concerning time, again, mental health and other things that we need to deal with. And to be the proper servant king, um, we need to do those things. Um, all of us who are live, again, we don't, we don't have kids at home anymore. Um, David and I kind of do uh, with kids in college. It's kind of a transition kind of stage. But... Um, we still need to be uh, servant kings. And we're gonna need to be that till we're 80, 90, or however long uh, we all live. And so at each stage of life, we can reevaluate. How can I be the best servant? How can I be the best leader? How can I protect uh, those in my care to whatever level that might happen to be? And, um, and then just, I don't think he said this, but I was thinking, Greg and I talk about this a lot. Um, we need to finish well. And not that Greg and I are on our deathbeds, but uh, we, we talk about members of the church who kind of, they retire from work and then they retire from the church. And, um, you know, we don't want that. And we don't want to do that ourselves whenever that time comes. We want to finish well. And we want the people at Fishinger and Kenny and people in the church universal to finish well. There are amazing opportunities people have. Uh, once they move into uh, a time of life. And uh, of course, for lots of people, it's, it's uh, helping with the grandkids. And, and that's finishing well. That's doing something very important. My dad, uh, one of the coolest, my dad retired really early from being a firefighter. He got his 25 years in and, and retired from that. He still barbered and drove trucks. I mean, he did all sorts of things after that. Um, but he was able to take care of Jared when Jared was born. Um, dad, my dad was Jared's daycare. And uh, how awesome was that? 
uh, talk about doing something that's just uh, amazingly beneficial to the whole family. And and Jared doesn't really remember that too well because he wasn't even two when we moved to Tennessee. But my dad took care of him for those, those the first 18 months or so. And uh, really, really cool. So whatever the goal, whatever the, the thing in life might be for any of us, let's, let's even now, um, uh, David, you're the youngest in here tonight, but anyone else who might be listening later, you know, no matter what your age is, start to think about it. Finish well finish life at a high point. And we've had some great examples of that. I, I, I could think of a, a lot of people, uh, Riley Dugan and, and others, but George Price is the one who uh, kind of comes to mind immediately. I mean, he worked for the church as well, really, till he died. I mean, he was still trying to organize the golden agers. He was doing all he could do. He was sending personal cards. Uh, after Marie died, he didn't stop. He sent everyone in the congregation birthday cards. I'm sure uh, uh, many of you got those. And um, so anyway, we want to finish well. And I think that's a really important thing for us to do. Um, and then he just throws out some questions. What kind of king are the people around you experiencing right now? What kind of king will they remember in the coming years? Um, and then he says, and I like this a lot, because obviously anytime you talk about being the man you ought to be, being the Christian you ought to be, being the husband you ought to be, being the child you ought to be, being the parent you ought to I mean, with any of these, I mean, obviously, we don't hit the standard. And so he says a sense of personal inadequacy is required <laughs> in this position. We must always humble ourselves before the Lord. We can always improve. We can always do better. But we need to realize we need to live right now. You know, we need to take wherever we're at and real okay, do the best we can. And that's that's a really good thing. But I, I really like that line. Um, okay, and then finally, the king as uh, shepherd. Um, and again, kind of a, a, an emphasis on uh, the provision and the protection. Obviously, a shepherd protects, but that's going to be more the warrior pillar. But he talks a lot about protection even in this, as I mentioned at the start. So uh, we'll get a little more... Uh, the, the, the protection a shepherd does, obviously, is a little bit different than the protection that a warrior is involved in. So in his main uh, illustration here is David. But um, so we, we have vision at the top of the pillar, provision to provide um, here as we uh, finish this up. So uh, Psalm 99.4, the king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. And uh, he, he crops this at the beginning of the chapter in his little, you know, some chapters and some books, they'll have scriptures at the top of the uh, first little bit of the page. These are on the, the left side of the page every time for these chapters. And he, he just says in it, the king in his might loves justice and righteousness. So he, he makes it that simple. And that's, and that's cool. And that's good. We should love those things. Um, uh, first Samuel 17, uh, 34, uh, through, uh, I, I just left 36 in there, 34 to 37. David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Uh, what a, and, and by the way, just, just a moment of humility with Saul. Saul was a good king right then. Saul was Saul had the people in mind. I mean, obviously, he had been driven to a point of frustration with Goliath, but but this was a moment of doing the right thing. This was a moment when Saul was the king he needed to be, and just said, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to utilize the people that that I can. I'm going to put them in the best position to win, so to speak, for us to to be more spiritual, to be more faithful. And he says, go and the Lord be with you. So a, a great statement from Saul. We don't have a ton of them. In scripture, uh, he kind of goes nuts, literally, uh, but but here uh, he's good. And David is the servant king, the shepherd king. 
David is the one who is willing to take initiative. He had a plan, he had faith, and, and he knew he could do it. I mean, David had total confidence in what he would be able to do on behalf of the Lord and, of course, the, uh, the Israelites, God's people. So pretty, pretty neat. And then I added this in. I, I had a funeral today um, and, uh, and actually have another one Monday. So I'll, I'm sure I'll be reading Psalm 23 again. But this gives us a template uh, for how we should be as a, a shepherd, as a servant, as, as a shepherd king, a servant king, um, following the Lord's example. And so David writes, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And so we, in turn, number one, we allow the Lord to be our master. We allow him to be our shepherd. We allow him to be our king. And then we're able to uh, copy that to the best of our abilities in our situations, in our realms, so to speak, in our, in our environments. And so we should do the same. We should provide rest and refreshment for people. We should strive to restore their souls, to lift them up. And we, of course, should lead them in paths of righteousness uh, for the sake of the Lord, for the sake of Christ, for the sake of the Spirit. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so again, we want to do the same. We, let's say we're going through a dark time in the family or a dark time in the congregation. Right now, kind of a dark year. Uh, for our world, for our culture in a lot of ways. Um, even though that's happening, we can help provide uh, the, the uplifting that people need. And we can cause the people, anyone under our influence, we can strive to help them um, uh, to, to cause their cup to overflow, to fill them up uh, with goodness and light, as, as we read earlier. Um, and so we also want goodness and mercy to follow the people under our care all the days of their lives. And whatever we can do, again, to help with that is, is absolutely uh, fabulous. So the king, uh, the, the servant king, the shepherd king should provide for physical needs, obviously, emotional needs, and the most important, of course, uh, spiritual needs. Uh, we as uh, shepherd kings, as servant kings, need to be having those things uh, in mind. Uh, we need to provide justice, and again, this would be more for for people with young children or even teens, but back more when there's more discipline going on in the home. Uh, be just, um, you know, do things the right way. Um, uh, but, well, I shouldn't say but, these things go hand in hand with God, uh, but we also need to provide mercy, and we need to provide honor. And then I liked this statement, a shepherd king, a servant king, never gives up, not for a lion, not for a bear, and not for a pain with a bite bigger than both. The servant king, the shepherd king, the king pro protects and provides no matter what, like Moses, like David, like Jesus. And so that's our, that's our goal. That's what we want uh, to do is provide as the uh, servant king. So um, I'll, I'll go back to that slide um, real quick. Any anything any of you want to add um, uh, into things uh, this evening? Feel free to do so. All right. Well, that's a lot of material, I know. Well, um, Chris, if you'd be willing, um, would you lead us in a, a closing prayer? Before you do that, let me just mention next week, um, we um, we start that warrior pillar. And so Braveheart Untainted is the first week. And then the week after that, the warrior at risk. So how we can make sure that we stay protected as we're trying to protect um, other people. So, all right. Uh, Chris, are you still there? Are you? Okay, I see you unmuted. Yeah, if you'll pray for us. Thank you. 
You're awesome, God. We, we thank you for the opportunity to be together and to learn more and, and to be the pillar of what you want us to be. Um, allow us to take this lesson and apply it to our lives so that we can go out and be the men we should be on a consistent basis and honor you in all we do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.